Thanks very much, Jenny, and thank you all for having us here today. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a very distinguished panel of um, arbitration practitioners. And our topic for today, as you know, is written advocacy in international arbitration. Uh, our panelists are going to draw from their extensive uh, ex experience both as advocates and arbitrators from both common law and civil law jurisdiction. Uh, we're going to walk you through the various facets of written submissions, um, beginning with briefs and also walking through witness statements, um, expert reports, and also bespoke arbitrary uh, submissions that are made to the tribunal. So we're really going to look at this from all different facets. Uh, we're going to reserve a little bit of time for Q&A, so please um, make sure that you hold your questions, and we look forward to a lively discussion today. Um, just to briefly introduce uh, the panel, to my uh, very far left, Jonathan Blackman is a partner at Cleary Gottlieb's New York office. He practices international, uh, international arbitration and international disputes, um, focusing in addition um, to banking and insurance law. He has participated in numerous international arbitrations involving both public international law and commercial disputes. Um, to my immediate left, Sam Samantha Rowe is a partner at Debo Voice and is based out of their London and Paris offices. Her practice focuses on international arbitration and public international law, and she has experience across a number of different industries and sectors, including energy, mining, construction, financial services, and pharmaceuticals. To my right, uh, Bom Su Kim is the managing partner at KNL Partners. He's previously served as a judge in di district courts of Korea before beginning his career as a counsel. Mr. Kim has also served as arbitrator in several ICC, LCIA, SIAC, and HKIAC disputes. He's the president of the Korean Council of International Arbitration and the former executive director of international relations for the Korean Bar Association. And last, but definitely not least, uh, Chip Rosenberg is, the count is a counsel at King & Spaulding's DC office. He also serves as the co-editor-in-chief of ITA in Review. Prior to joining King & Spaulding, Chip clerked for the Honorable Ch Charles N. Brower at the Iran US Claim Tribunal in The Hague. And he has also served in that capacity as tribunal secretary in multiple international relation arbitrations. Um, so just to kick off our discussion today, let's begin with perhaps the most, um, the first thing that comes to mind when you think of written submissions, which are briefs and memorials. Um, so John, how does written advocacy differ in arbitration compared with litigation? And do you adopt different strategies um, when making submissions before a panel of arbitrators as opposed to the court? Uh, I'm going to begin, actually, with... Uh, how they're the same, because the purpose of all advocacy, both written and oral, is to persuade. Uh, the difference in arbitration is uh, the technique of persuasion in written advocacy, which is what we're discussing now, uh, is uh, more extensive. Uh, and the reason for that is, to some extent, quite banal. Uh, there are no page limits. Uh, in uh, every uh, district court, federal district court in the United States, there's a page limit uh, for a brief. And no matter how complex the matter may be, uh, the limits vary from something like 25 pages in the Southern District of New York uh, to about, my last recollection is maybe 45 pages in the uh, district court for the District of Columbia. And while page limits can be extended uh, on application, uh, it's by no means the norm that they are. So in litigation, one is required to be very succinct. In arbitration, by contrast, except at least in my experience, with agreed limits on post-hearing briefs, there are no page limits. And memorials, which is arbitration speak for briefs, often run hundreds of pages. Uh, in addition, they're accompanied by written witness statements, which can also go on for dozens or sometimes 100 pages, depending on the case, uh, each of which is accompanied with voluminous written exhibits uh, and expert reports similarly. So there's a lot more scope for writing. Uh, what that means is that one has the luxury of delving into issues in great detail, both factually and legally. Uh, and the converse of that is that 
arbitrators expect that. Uh, a judge would be beside herself if she were faced with a 300, 400 page memorial of the kind that one sees in complex arbitrations, which is precisely why there are page limits. Arbitrators, by contrast, of course, uh, are paid for their time. <laughs> and so uh, uh, they don't mind and indeed expect to be fully informed. Uh, so I find it really, although sometimes it can get a bit much, on the whole, uh, really great to be able to talk at length. And one has to talk at length because since so much is in writing and since the hearing is basically devoted to oral pleading, as a continental lawyer would call it, openings and closings as we common lawyers would call it, uh, and cross-examination of witnesses, you really have to make your case to a significant extent in writing uh, and you have to deal with often very complex issues, and the only way you can deal with that is through dissecting them and deconstructing them uh, uh, in detail. Uh, so I think that's really the principal difference, and that leads you to what is your different strategy. You always want to have themes. You always want to be effective and punchy, and you do that, in my experience, in a memorial by saying at the beginning what your basic themes are, what this case is about. Uh, and you continue to talk about that theme throughout. But at the same time, you can then sort of weave in all of the facts, no matter how complicated, that support your narrative and also refute the other side's attempt to provide a counter narrative. And you can do that all in writing. And, the effective advocate is someone who does that. So I think that's really important to think about. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, writing something that is punchy and persuasive. So when we think about that, uh, Chip, do you have any like Ten Commandments of uh, a good written submission? Sure. Well, I don't have the uh, commandments. I call them more practice pointers, and I don't have ten. I came up with four. But maybe I'll share them with you, and then my, my distinguished and experienced panelists, maybe they can add to the list, and we can together come up with 10. Uh, but first is short and to the point. Mark Twain said, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. The goal of persuasive written advocacy is to make it easy for the arbitrator to read the pleading and to understand it. So as a practice pointer, you should ask yourself, what is this word? What is this phrase? What is this sentence? What does this add to the plea? If the answer is not much, you might consider removing it. Number two, be credible and don't cry wolf. You want to, in your written advocacy, you want to sound reasonable. You don't want to over-exaggerate or you want to limit your over-exaggerations because you don't want to lose your credibility in front of the tribunal. An example of this is you receive a submission from the other side. The submission comes in, it's due at midnight, it comes in at one o'clock in the morning, so it's one hour late. So now instead of having four months to file your response, you have four months minus one hour. It is totally appropriate to write to the tribunal to notify them that the other party has failed to comply with the rules of the arbitration. It's another story, and you may lose credibility, you start saying, this is a flagrant violation of my client's due process rights, and the legitimacy of the proceeding is, is at stake here. So you want to just be careful with your exaggerations so you don't lose face in front of the trial. <clears throat> Number three, prove it. Don't just say it, prove it. So in your written pleading, it shouldn't just be your writing and you saying, oh, I say this, I say this you should be referencing factual exhibits and legal authorities in order to prove your case. So these monster submissions we have in international arbitration that give a 500 page brief, they're accompanied by hundreds and hundreds of factual exhibits and legal authorities in order to demonstrate to prove your case. And number four, this is a, not really a practice pointer, but it's kind of like my, my pet peeve, is consistency. So, you have your written pleading, you have a footnote, 
you use your blue book and you say C, Daimler versus Argentina. In footnote one, the C is italics. In footnote three, when you use a C again, don't use underline, don't use bold, use italics. Mm. That, that might sound like silly, but if you are inconsistent, it looks sloppy. The arbitrators then question not just the footnotes and the formatting, but possibly the merits of your argument. So you want it to maintain credibility, to maintain that a persuasive written work product, you want to make sure that it's, it's clean and it's consistent throughout. Those are the four I have. Anyone have any additional commandment? Stay four. <laughs> four it is. Um, so, Bamsu, thinking about you know your experience in the arbitration field, do you notice a difference in the way that um, practitioners submit written pleadings in like the common law versus the civil law traditions? Well, um, Eva, um, before I, I'm addressing those issues, probably um, be <clears throat> more kind of sensible. For me to, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, to talk about uh, developments in, in arbitration in Asia because it's quite new to us. It's only probably 20 to 30 years um, when the Asian Asian uh, countries or companies have been exposed to international trades. That, that you know, only triggered the uh, international arbitration and what it is. So we have learned a lot from um, from practice. We just um, drag into <clears throat> those disappeared without having any um, education or knowledge before that. But um, soon we kind of learned that uh, it's not that different from what we have learned at, at school, because every lawyer or every practitioner was taught by, by uh, professors that um, you know, in order to make a very good submission, you, number one, you should know what the issues are, and number two, uh, and what uh, what are your answers or, or positions as to those issues? And number three, why you think that your position is right? So no, ma no matter what uh, you know, we have been taught in common law jurisdictions or civil law jurisdictions, at the end of end of the day, quite the outcome would be quite same or similar. So we um, we um, kind of Asian uh, practitioners have have learned. Uh, you know, from our school, but at the same time, we have seen the same or similar kind of approaches uh, being in uh, international dispute, including this international arbitrations. So, um, having said that, um, but um, at least two points I have uh, witnessed or I have seen some differences between the two you know, cultures. Number one is uh, the parole evidence rules. Because I, uh, what I learned is that uh, parole evidence rule is, is saying that um, introducing new or new evidence except uh, the, what is written in the contract or uh, documents are not prohibited, uh, not allowed, with, uh, with uh, very uh, rare exceptions. Whereas uh, in civil law countries, it's, uh, they are quite uh, they are treating that in a very lenient way, so that uh, we have been. Not uh, lo legally allowed, but we, uh, in practice, we have been making some attempts or efforts to introduce new evidences or related evidence evidences which would have been uh, prohibited or not allowed under uh, common law countries. So that is the attitude toward those pro evidence is a bit different. So we have been, um, you know, fighting always in terms of uh, document productions or the relevance to, to, to uh, relevance to documents or, or exhibits uh, whenever we are facing uh, with uh, the uh, common law or practitioners uh, at the dispute. That is number one difference between the two um, cultures. Uh, number two is um, the most civil law countries, we have notion of started decisis or started, started decisis. But it, the application is quite limited in that uh, only that uh, the legal, legal uh, implication is only for a specific case, not in general fashion or not in uh, generality. So, um, so with that, um, the court's precedents have been treated in a quite different way. That uh, in um, in common law countries, the court 
precedents are quite important or, or most decisive to, to determine the issues. But it is a bit different from, um, from that in, in civil law countries because we are uh, statu statutory basis um, in the countries. So all interpretation is coming from those statutes, not, not only from um, the court interpretations, but also from other sources. So we, um, so in terms of providing or, or submitting authorities, the civil law background lawyers are always trying to effort to make very uh, wide variety of authorities instead of not only for those court precedents, but also some other authorities, including the, the, um, the commentaries or even um, the precedents or commentaries from other countries. So for example, when we are fighting uh, for Korean companies, we have been sometimes submitting uh, authorities from Germany or Japan to support our cases. So those two, the parole evidence rules are quite different. And number, number two, the uh, authorities, in terms of the, the width of, of authorities are quite different, different from each other. That's my um, observations based on my uh, limited experiences. I have a, a kind of comment on that which covers a lot of uh, ground in arbitration. That is that over the decades that I've been doing it, there is really been a, rather a convergence between yes. civil law and common law approaches. One sees it in terms of evidence gathering in the IBA rules, which are a conscious effort to sort of strike a balance between civil law evidence and common law evidence. And uh, one sees it uh, uh, in uh, uh, written advocacy as well, where uh, it is quite common in my experience because there are no rules of evidence in arbitrations of the kind you have in mm -hmm. common law courts where something is excluded. I mean, that rarely happens. A party can submit as part of its case, uh, as part of the hundreds of exhibits, all kinds of things that from a common law perspective would violate the hearsay rule uh, or lack foundation uh, or all kinds of things. And arbitrators, whether they're from a civil law or common law background, have become sufficiently sophisticated that they, to use the parlance, take them for what they're worth. Uh, and it's certainly appropriate and, and desirable to point out that this piece of paper, you know, is written by somebody, you know, long after the fact. It's not contemporaneous. The person doesn't appear to have contemporaneous knowledge, etc. The arbitrators will say, okay, well, that's interesting, you know, and read it for what it's worth. They won't throw it out, particularly because they want to protect the record of letting basically everything become part of the record. Uh, but I think that's a, a sort of interesting area where in practice there's been a bit of a convergence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even with my much more limited experience, I've definitely seen that the, the common law and civil law distinctions seem to matter less and less. Um, so, you know, Chip, you mentioned that the importance of uh, credibility before the tribunal, and when we think about witness statements, um, that's one area where you might have the credibility gap because witness statements are drafted usually by an attorney far in advance of a hearing um, and usually stands as direct testimony at the hearing. So when you think about this issue, how can attorneys um, draft a witness statement that can withstand a blistering a cross-examination and remains consistent and credible throughout the case. Absolutely, and as a preliminary matter, I think it's just important to emphasize that a witness statement is written testimony of a witness, but it's not the witness just writing down something and, and handing in like an affidavit. The counsel works very closely with the witness in order to appropriately draft a witness there. So my first piece of advice is External counsel should be working with witnesses in order to prepare witness statements. So a best practice would be external counsel sits down with the witness, asks them questions, gets their side of the story, gets their take on things. <coughs> external counsel takes their notes, goes back to their office, closes the door, and types it all up mm -hmm. into a nice-looking witness statement, appropriately framing the issues, emphasizing what needs to be emphasized, most likely there's going to be a bunch of holes there, 
or there's going to be areas where you need additional information, additional clarification. So then external counsel goes back to the witness in order to fill in those holes and get those additional details. And this process of interview, write-up, interview, you just repeat as necessary until you have a complete and comprehensive and accurate witness statement. I also find it's helpful in witness statements to refer to documents in order to enhance the credibility and the persuasiveness of the witness statement. So if you have a witness that says, oh yeah, I'm, I'm testifying, I attended a meeting five years ago, and uh, these are the people that attended, and this is what happened at the meeting, and I was really surprised by what they said there. You're, if you're an arbitrator and you're reading that, you could be like, ah, that's, I could believe you or I could not believe you. Uh, I, give me some help here. If the witness statement references documents like, hey, here is the invitation to this meeting showing that there was actually a meeting. Here's the agenda to the meeting showing who, who was at the meeting and, and what was discussed. Here are the meetings of the, minute, of, of the meeting. Here is an email that I sent after the meeting contemporaneously memorializing what I thought of the meeting. Having those as exhibits to a witness statement, that enhances the credibility of the witness statement and in turn the persuasiveness of the witness statement. And then my last pointer on witness statements, in order to protect cross-examination and, and to, to make the witness stand up to cross-examination, external counsel really has to know who the witness is in order to appropriately draft a witness statement. On cross-examination, anything that's in the witness statement or any of the documents that are exhibited to the witness statement, they're all fair game. So the witness should be very familiar with the contents of his, of his or her witness statement as well as all of the documents that are exhibited to it and what all those documents say. So you really need to know your witness in drafting the witness statement and helping them draft the witness statement. Because, for example, if the witness is not affiliated with a company, and is super busy doing other things, having a 80-page witness statement citing 80 documents, that individual might not be likely to comprehensively review the content of the witness statement, to review all of these exhibits, and then they may get roasted on cross-examination. In contrast, if you have like an employee <coughs> excuse me, of a company who spent 10 years working the company, working exclusively on the one project, the project is now dead, so the employee is just sitting around with all of this history of the project and with nothing else to do. That's the kind of witness that can handle a long witness statement with all of these documents that they're already familiar with because they have the time to get up to speed on it and they have the time that if cross-examined, they'll be familiar with it and they won't get roasted on cross. Yeah, I, um, I, I agree with that. I think it's... Um, Different witnesses can play different functions. You will, your ideal witness will be the sort of first-hand eyewitness who actually has like relevant, I was there and this is what I saw, experiences to share. And then I completely agree, that's, that has to be the way that you develop that statement. Um, there are others, and I'm thinking particularly in sort of big construction arbitrations, where you, you could, I guess you could try and find a witness who has first-hand experience of each and every claim that's being put forward in the construction arbitration. But more likely, you're going to try to limit the number just to make it more manageable. And you may then be using somebody like a project manager for a particular period of time who won't have all the detail to hand and who will be relying really on documents and you'll be relying on them to take the time to really get to know those documents. And then you might consider taking a different approach which is actually starting with the documents pulling a statement together and then sitting down with them and you, you literally have to go line by line sentence by sentence they have to agree with everything that's in there but it's just um, depending on who your witness is and what their function is it, it, it sometimes requires a bit of a finessed approach yeah that's all really practical advice um, so what about the opposite situation where you might have a perfectly crafted witness statement supported by tons of documents and the witness fails to show up to the hearing? So how um, should arbitrators balance the admissibility of that evidence or, 
against the, um, a party's right to cross-examine, do you toss out the, the witness statement? Do you admit it into evidence? Um, maybe, John, you can give us your thoughts. Well, I've had this experience uh, recently, relatively recently, within the last <coughs> couple of years. The, <coughs> the other side made a conscious strategic decision not to show up because they were afraid their witnesses would get killed. Uh, so we were left with a pile of witness statements, all of which we were prepared to <coughs> shred the witness on, no witnesses. Uh, the arbitrators have the right, uh, as a matter of discretion, to just strike the witness statement under the rules. Uh, and we were tempted uh, to uh, tell them to do that. But we concluded, knowing that the award would be challenged, as awards often are, and in this case it was guaranteed by the very strategy that was adopted, which was to not show up, blame the tribunal for scheduling it a mere nine months in advance at a time that was uh, uh, one of eight QCs wasn't available uh, as a denial of uh, due process and equality of arms and all the rest. Uh, we knew the award would be challenged, as indeed it has been. And so we took the view with the tribunal that, again, take it for what it's worth. We think it's worth very little. And remember, arbitrations, or maybe you don't know this, unlike court proceedings, there's no such thing as a default. Even if the other side doesn't show up, there's going to be a hearing. Your witnesses are going to have to be put on. And so we knew there was going to be a hearing. And we did at the hearing was to kind of, in effect, reframe the cross-examination show using documents, the witness wasn't there to be asked about them, why the witness was clearly embroidering or lying, uh, and tell the tribunal, take it for what it's worth, and we've just shown you, not worth anything. And uh, the tribunal, very experienced tribunal, uh, followed exactly that approach. They made sure in their award to go through the witness statements of the absent witnesses and show why the evidence did not support those statements. And I think that will stand them in good stead. Uh, the hearing in this particular case is uh, in a few weeks in the high court. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think the other side is going to be hard put to say that uh, anything unfair happened. All their witness statements were taken into account. and. The tribunal made appropriate findings about credibility based on the whole record, and those are the most unassailable kind of findings that an arbitral tribunal can make. So let's maybe shift our focus a little bit to uh, expert reports. You know, these are written submissions made before a tribunal of evidentiary nature, um, but unlike a witness statement, these are not uh, drafted by attorneys. Um, so Sam, from a counsel's perspective, how do you how do you shepherd a party appointed expert report? Um, can it still become an effective piece of written advocacy if it's not actually written by you? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess define written by you because whereas <laughs> I agree that the expert will generally hold the pen first, they don't necessarily hold the pen last. Um, I, look, if you think about advocacy as, as, as in its sort of very basic meaning, it's a piece of persuasion. And in that respect, yes, of course, that your expert reports have to be persuasive. Um, the arbitrators have to walk away from reading the expert reports and having seen the experts and agree with them if you're going to prevail on whatever particular issue it is on which the expert is opining. Um, there are a few sort of basic points about expert reports, though, that you probably need to sort of keep into account when thinking how best to frame them in a persuasive manner. Um, it's sort of axiomatic that you're not going to hire an expert whose view supports the other side's case and doesn't support your own case. It, 
be a bit of a waste of your client's money to do that. Um, but at the same time, if you have somebody who's clearly a gun for hire and who is just sort of willing to adopt whatever position it is that the party who has engaged them <coughs> wishes to advance, that's not going to be particularly helpful to the process or to the tribunal or really to anybody. So there's a very fine line to tread because everybody understands that they are there essentially as part of a team despite their overriding duty being to the tribunal. Um, but you can't go too far um, towards the sort of partiality, obviously just sort of doing what the client has told them to do. Um, so how to tread this fine line? I mean, I think it starts with your selection of expert. Um, what have they already written? Take a very comprehensive approach to trying to figure that out. Is it generally supportive of what your client wishes to argue in the arbitration? If it isn't, they're probably not the right expert for you. Is it credible? Do they fall within a sort of majority school of thought? Or if they're within a minority, is it a credible and sort of arguable minority that they fall into? Um, and then when it comes to the report itself, I think the important thing to bear in mind is that their opinion is what they've been hired for, but it's ultimately the least important point for the tribunal. Um, it, it, the, it's how they got to that opinion. It's their credibility again, and it's how they have sort of supported their ultimate conclusions in much the same way as Ch one of Chip's four commandments was prove it. It's exactly the same for an expert as well. And it's going to be critical that they can sort of point to, if they're an academic, to other academics who have come to the same conclusion. If they can point to the fact that the industry that they're in, um, that this is a common approach that's adopted by industry players, or perhaps it's a common approach that's adopted by market participants, that's all going to help. Um, it needs to be sort of very logically, clearly set out and reason. You need, want to explain the available methodologies, why the expert has selected that methodology in particular, and then they need to apply that to the facts and assumptions that they've been given to reach their conclusion, which, as I've said, is sort of the least important part of, of the process. And then I think the final thing that an expert can do to be persuasive and to be helpful to the tribunal is to try to help them to narrow the issues. So where do they agree with the expert on the other side? Um, and what are the major issues of disagreement, and why are they right on those issues. And to the extent that they can do that, they're already going to be sort of eight-tenths of the way towards getting the tribunal on their side. Because if there's one thing tribunals hate, it's experts that just take every point and are sort of unwilling to be um, almost collegiate and work together to sort of getting to the tribunal to, to the ultimate issues that they need to decide. Yeah, that's a really helpful. Um... So, you know, talking about how you appear before the tribunal, appearing to be collegial, um, you know, tri tribunals also have the latitude and the ability to request a joint expert report. So that's when two experts from both sides get together and write one report. Um, so, Bamsu, having served as arbitrator in a number of instances, uh, what are your views on the effectiveness of a joint report? And in your opinion, both as counsel and as an arbitrator, can it still be an effective piece of written advocacy? Yes, sir. Well, um, well, Mr. Gosem um, explained about what really is happening uh, when you're engaging or, or working with experts. I you know, fully agree with that. Um, and the um, tendency is that uh, experts are acting as if they are a, a different type of advocates for their clients. So it's really uh, difficult to kind of compromise or harmonize two stock different you know, expert reports in a given uh, proceeding. So um, as uh, Eva mentioned, sometimes uh, the tribunal really want to have a kind of joint report. But I have found that um, those efforts are not that effective, unfortunately. Um, they, they really um, rarely agree, even on very basic uh, things, except calculations or or mathematics. So um, in, in order to, even though they agree on those points or some issues, still they really um, require or ask assumptions or conditions or limitations on those agreements. So uh, at the end of the day, I don't, um, you know, to, to date, 
I, I don't uh, have very um, pleasant uh, experiences from those uh, joint expert reports. So uh, another alternative is to those uh, joint expert reports. Sometimes tribunal really uh, want to have a kind of uh, so-called hot tubbing uh, situations, meaning uh, to put those two experts into the same spot and um, the tribunal are asking um, the same questions and um, having them debate each other very, uh, in a very um, short manner. So with that, um, you know, it may sometimes work. So we, we can tell which expert is more credible or more reliable or more, more consistent, consistent with what he already said, while, while the other uh, expert is not that 100% uh, credible as compared to what he already said in his report. So um, sometimes those hot tubbing kind of situations may be very helpful for tribunal to have better understanding of what the issues are, what the difficulties are arising from this dispute. That's my limited observation. Yeah, and it's also um, helpful to explain to your expert that they're not actually physically going to be in a hot tub with another <laughs> they're opposing the side. Um, so, you know, we've, lo we've looked at some of the more formal uh, submissions that are made to the, the arbitration panel, um, but they're often, especially uh, in arbitration, in, in common law practices, um, opportunities to make informal applications or bespoke applications or just correspondence with the tribunal. Uh, so thinking about these um, sort of on-the-fly submissions, if I might say, um, how can a lawyers use this as an opportunity to advocate for their, for their client and what strategies are most effective, Sam? Um, so this, I have to say, is sort of one of my favourite things about arbitration. If you think about kind of the memorials as the major battles, um, the kind of informal in-between stuff are, are the sort of skirmishes that you get into with the other side. And I just think they're, they're lots of fun. They're also the reason why my teams hate working with me. <laughs> and you'll probably see why, because I see each and, e each and every written piece of whatever that you put in front of a tribunal, or frankly, that's even just inter partes, is an opportunity to persuade, to advance your case, to build on your case theory. Um, and I'll sort of get into that in a, a little while, sort of top, top tips as to how to do that. Um, but if you think about what we're talking about, it's, um, it's correspondence. It's correspondence to the tribunal. It's correspondence between the parties. It's, for example, red fern schedules where you're putting forward your request for documents or your objections to the other side's request for documents. Um, it's procedural applications. It's interim um, and bespoke and um, more substantive submissions. Um, so to take just one case that I have been doing over the past year, in the context of that one case, we had a security for costs application. We had a motion to strike evidence. Um, we had two applications about witnesses failing to appear and what should happen to their witness statements. Um, we had an application to postpone the hearing. Um, and we obviously had our document requests and we had a number of exchanges of letters related to those document requests as well. Um, so what, what to do with these? What approach should you take to them? And I'm not, they should be short. Don't get me wrong. They absolutely should be short because as much as tribunals are happy and prepared to get hundreds of pages on memorials where you're really talking about the substance of the case, they're going to be much less enthusiastic about receiving a 100-page letter on why the other side hasn't produced all the documents you're expecting. But at the same time, they need to be sufficiently detailed to get the result that you ultimately want to get. Just saying, well, they didn't produce these documents okay great so why, why should they have produced the documents why are they relevant and material to your case why do you think that the other side has them all of those questions that are integral to getting the relief that you need need to be answered um, and also, also as I sort of said at the beginning it's, it's an opportunity to advance your case themes if the other side is not producing documents that you know that they have or that you very strongly believe that they have does that fit into a bigger theme about their behavior in the actual merits of the arbitration? Are you trying to say that they're underhand, that they have sort of been hiding things? Is this something that you can build upon? Um, so in terms of just a few top tips as to how to go about doing all of this, I think the starting point always has to be, what do you want? What do you want to get out of this letter that you're putting before the tribunal? 
people because if you're unclear on that it's just going to be annoying and it's just going to come across as whining so you need to start and I would have it in the very first paragraph sort of this is what we're asking you for and I would also actually include a sort of draft request for relief at the end of the letter or even perhaps append a draft order of what you want um, the tribunal to issue be clear and be structured um, I actually read this in somebody else's um, thoughts as I was preparing for the panel to maybe include a reading list rather than sort of reiterating everything that you've said before. Maybe just say, here are the kind of key passages in our memorials or, or whatever um, that are relevant. Um, take a holistic approach. How does this fit into your broader case and think carefully about the consequences of the tribunal accepting or denying the relief and that sort of goes to Chip's point earlier that you don't want to be kind of um, crying wolf about legitimacy and due process to the extent that it is not warranted um, and finally be credible and be polite I've heard some real horror stories about um, sort of very rudely worded letters to tribunals and it's just doesn't go down very well. Remember that you want to keep them on side. Um, but yeah, that's my my views on, on as I said, my favourite part of arbitrating. <laughs> I, I definitely have I have a great working relationship with one of the partners at Scadden, and he fondly refers to these applications as nasty grams. It makes it a little bit more delightful to work for. Um, so you know, we've looked at almost all the different aspects of both formal and informal submissions. But one thing that we don't necessarily know going into an arbitration is whether there are going to be uh, post-hearing memorials or post-hearing submissions. Um, so these are kind of like they straddle a bit of the both worlds, right? There are more formal than uh, bespoke applications, but um, they're not necessarily planned for. So John, you know, looking at your broad experience, um, how persuasive are these submissions? Do tribunal members welcome them, or are they just another thing to slog through? I think in, in most cases I've had, there have been uh, uh, post-hearing uh, memorials. Uh, they have, in my experience, invariably been page limited. Uh, I think they can be quite helpful. Uh, the tribunal likes to have things distilled, particularly the witness testimony. The one thing that's new is that at the hearing, witnesses have been cross-examined. And that can often have a powerful impact on the way the case is perceived. And the only place you can talk about that and put the cross-examination into the perspective of the larger case is often uh, in a post-hearing memorial. Sometimes not. I have a favorite incident where I was doing an arbitration, and uh, uh, there were two claims uh, by the claimant. We were representing the respondent. And testifying on cross, the principal of the claimant basically gave away one of the claims uh, and did it in such a marked way that the chair of the tribunal said, did you say that? <laughs> and so we didn't need to spend a lot of time on that in the, in the post-hearing memorial because we knew the tribunal had taken that on board. We obviously had a paragraph or so. Uh, but sometimes it's more complicated than that. And pulling it all together in a post-hearing memorial can, can really be quite effective. Uh, so uh, I think those usually work. There's another form of post-hearing submission, which is a subgenre of the nasty gram, uh, which I find to be something that tribunals really hate. And there are certain uh, lawyers who are addicted to the idea of making post-hearing submissions of additional evidence. I just learned. We just discovered. This witness just appeared magically. The case has been going for three years. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we want to submit it and, you know, invoking what is referred to in a lot of the literature as the paranoia of due process to threaten the tribunal that if you don't accept this late piece of evidence, uh, the world is going to come to an end and your award is going to be uh, uh, endangered. And I think tribunals really hate that. Uh, at some point, they will draw the line. I'm doing a case now where... They have, in fact, allowed 
two post-hearing submissions, but they just said, this is it, no more. We're not hearing anything else. Don't tell us about any new evidence on this subject. We heard it all. Uh, basically, they said that in hike verba in their last decision. And so the party propounding this not only totally annoyed the tribunal, but I think probably going to the critical issue of credibility, undermine their credibility with respect even to the two new exhibits the tribunal did let in because they just come across as playing games. Uh, and uh, so I think that is, is kind of bad practice and really should be uh, resisted. I think it undermines more than helps the case of the party who's doing that. So we that's, that's a great segue from um, what are the worst practices to what are some of the best practices. Um, so Sam, how, in your opinion, um, can written advocacy be used to complement oral advocacy? You know, oral advocacy always seems to be the more sexy, uh, you know, uh, spotlight. Um, yeah, so I think, um, and, and this, this echoes a lot of the comments that have already been made, but um, the thing to remember about the written submissions is that they are your opportunity to make a first, the best first impression that you possibly can. If you haven't done that and you're going into the hearing um, and you're already on the back foot, that's not a great position to be in. Um, so I think not underestimating their importance is, is really key. Um, and then in the same way as... Uh, what I think a good expert can do in terms of filtering the issues for a tribunal. I think party effective advocates can do that too. You know, you start out in your memorial and it's a bit of a sort of everything with the kitchen sink approach and you throw it all in there and then you see what the other side comes back with in their counter memorial. And that's when you've really got to start sort of critically thinking, okay, well now I know what my case is and I know what their case is, so what do I really want the tribunal to focus on? And you can get all of that down and structured in writing in your reply brief. Um, and I think it's also really important while you're filtering, as John said earlier, this is going to be your only opportunity to get the detail in. Your opening argument is probably going to be three hours long. And you're going to be trying to fit cross-examinations of like umpteen number of witnesses. And whatever number it is, it's going to be more than you ever feel like you have time to cover in the amount of time that you've been given for the merits hearing. Um, the oral hearing is not the place to set out like the 10 reasons why this case that the other side thinks is really great for them is wrongly decided and isn't relevant and isn't whatever else. That has to be put into um, the brief. And if you're th when you're thinking about sort of how to be comprehensive without sacrificing clarity and brevity, which are key attributes of a good memorial, um, one thing that we have adopted a few times is sometimes to have an annex to your memorial. So you've got your kind of main case and what you think is important in the main brief structured and, and set out how you want to. And then if there's stuff where you're kind of like, well, we don't think this is important at all, but the other side clearly does, and who knows ultimately what the tribunal's going to decide. You can just kind of say, look, you know, this is irrelevant because X, Y, Z, but to the extent you're interested, our more fulsome response is appended at Annex A. Um, and then I think finally, just be careful and think ahead, and this goes a bit to Chip's point. Um, Address inconsistencies and weaknesses in, in your case to the extent that you know about them at the outset <laughs> and try not to create them, as you suggest. <laughs> um, and that really requires, you know, the sort of most comprehensive document collection and review process, speaking to all the people who are relevant, making sure you pay close attention to what the other side has to say about things and then addressing that too. So Chip, um, you know, I started off this conversation asking you what the Ten Commandments are. Um, what advice would you give to students or young practitioners um, on how they can improve their written advocacy and craft compelling narratives? Sure. So I, I throw a couple of tips for law students and young practitioners in order to improve their writing. And thank you. And I'm saving it till the end as your reward for sitting through the entire <laughs> presentation. Um, for law students, if you have the opportunity to join a law review or a law journal, I think that those are really valuable skills because you're reading a good piece of writing, you're revising the writing, and you're editing footnotes. So you're improving your writing. And these are the skills that 
you'll be doing, you'll be, you'll, you, these are the actions you'll be doing as a junior associate in a law firm. You'll be doing a lot less oral advocacy and a lot more initial writing and cleaning up writing. As a law student or recent grad, my advice is to write, write, write. There are a lot of opportunities out there in order to write, and the more that you write, the stronger your writing is going to become. So a couple of examples. There is a online blog called the Clure Arbitration Blog, and every day, more or less, <clears throat> they post a blog post on some development in international arbitration. These are like one to two pages long. Sometimes they're just a summary of a recent case and explaining why that's relevant. Sometimes it's a, a, a development in the field and then it's an explanation of why that's relevant. Clue Arbitration Blog is always looking for articles. So as a law student or as a junior practitioner, you identify something in the news, you write something up, you get it published. Second, attend a conference and then draft up a summary of the conference and get that short summary published on some international arbitration website like Global Arbitration Review. They're always looking for reporters to report on and publish summaries of conferences so that the international arbitration community that isn't able to come to the event can learn about what, what happened. Three, there are young lawyer writing competitions sponsored by very, uh, several international arbitration organizations, including CPR, YADR, uh, Young ICSID, and Young ITA. Uh, these are great opportunities to write on some development or, or issue in the field of international arbitration. And if you are successful in the competition, you could really get some really great publicity in the international arbitration community. Lastly, there is a nonprofit organization that I like to promote. It's called the IACL Project. It's the International Arbitration Case Law Project. And the project has volunteer junior editors. And the role of a junior editor is to take one of these 500 page investment treaty arbitration awards and to summarize it into a concise 10-page publication addressing the major facts, the major holdings, and the major reasoning. And then those publications are, are published on the IACL website. So you get not only the experience of taking something very long or very complex and neatly summarizing it into a shorter piece, but then you also get a publication attributed to you. So thanks very much, Chip. That's really helpful. Um, I'm mindful of the time, so I do want to open the floor for any last minute questions to our panel. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay. All right. Well, isn't one another form of writing the most like for <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right, because uh, I think for a few reasons, you're in a very different situation. You're right, it's, especially if it's an emergency arbitrator, you're right at the outset of, the case, of getting hired, probably, like it's the number one thing you, that you've been asked to do. Um, provisional measures, again, like typically come pretty early in a dispute before you've fully got your arms around um, all of the facts and all of the law. So I think... Um, <coughs> Getting as much detail as you possibly can within the time constraints is good and not overstating anything. Don't speculate about stuff that you don't yet know. Typically, it's a pretty low bar on the merits that you have to cross. Like I think it's like prima facie case. Okay. So just kind of having that, that in the back of your mind and not trying to sort of overstep what you can realistically say at that stage. Um, use a model. That always cuts out like 50% of the time. Like try and find something within the firm or whatever that somebody's done before and just use that and essentially crib as much of it as you possibly can. Like probably the legal argument in terms of standards and stuff is going to be the same. So just go with it. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's it. I don't know if anyone else has. Yeah, I just say, and it, it goes along very much with what Sam said. I mean, the key to success on uh, provisional measures to show irreparable harm, that's where you have to go into detail mm -hmm. and show what the harm is going to be. Uh, if you can't show that and can't persuade the typically emergency arbitrator or maybe tribunal, uh, you're not going to get the relief. Uh, and the, the ultimate merits issues are you have to show that you have, you know, an arguable case, but that's all you have to show. Uh, and so uh, focus your attention. And when you're talking about the irreparable harm, also show that it's irreparable harm that you hadn't been able to anticipate, because if it turns out that you, you know, this, you've been sitting on this issue for a year uh, before the arbitration began, uh, and you're the claimant, uh, then uh, that's going to undercut your irreparable harm. Yeah. And, and proportionality as well. So there's been a lot of cases where um, claimants have sought, in the investment treaty sphere, where claimants have sought um, interim relief, trying to put in abeyance the application of taxes to their investment, particularly if those taxes are ultimately going to have an expropriatory effect. Um, and they're really you're saying, look, if they apply this tax to us now, our investment is gone. Like, it's gone. We can't afford to keep it running. We certainly can't afford to keep it running through a decision on the merits in this arbitration. On the other hand, if you're not saying that the respondent state can never apply the tax, I mean, that there's a huge question mark over the efficacy of specific relief, full stop. Um, but, uh, you know, the tribunal could find in favour of either party. And if at the end of the day they say, you can now go and recoup the taxes, it's, it's a matter of delay rather as vis-a-vis -vis a matter of my investment's going to be destroyed. And that's not always going to work out in favour of the claimant in every, in every situation. And there may be some security for costs implications there too. Um, but in particular, if you can perhaps make an offer of, you know, you know we'll put the money into escrow or whatever, um, the proportion of the tribunal will be really interested in that. Any other questions? No? All right, if there are no further questions, um, all that remains is for me to thank the panel for their time and also for you guys. For